All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's um, webinar about electric vehicles and doing a quick 101 about everything EVs. Um, I hope everyone's having a great April 1st so far and, and that no one's gotten pranked too hard. Um, my name is Stephen Allman. I will be the host for this webinar. Um, I work at Forth. I've been here for two years. I'm a program manager here, and I manage our Ride and Drive program, which uh, essentially is a uh, program where we bring out electric vehicles and just let people get behind the wheel and, and take them for a spin. Obviously, with COVID, we've switched to doing things like webinars um, and doing more virtual outreach. All right. So before we get into it, I'd like to take a moment to um, you know give a special thanks to Clackamas County um, and the Escada Public Library for really making this webinar possible. Um, and I will actually hand it off to Kelsey Mass with uh, Clackamas County's Sustainability and Solid Waste program to um, give a quick uh, review about uh, different events that they're doing. Thank you so much, Stephen. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey, and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving at Clackamas County in their Sustainability and Solid Waste program. We're so excited to partner with Forth and Estacada Public Library to put this event on and talk about all things electric vehicles tonight. Before Stephen gets started, I wanted to talk a little bit about some climate-related projects that Clackamas County has underway that the community has the opportunity to participate in. Clackamas County is currently working on a climate action plan with the goal to have a, pl a plan adopted for the community by 2023. This plan was directed by our Board of County Commissioners in effort to reach the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. To break this down, carbon neutrality is when we absorb as much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases as we emit. While 2050 may seem far away, to reach our goal of carbon neutrality, we will need to take ambitious actions quickly. This plan will lay out a broad path for the next 30 years and what we need to do to bring our emissions down. It will also look at how we can minimize future impacts, become a more resilient community, and mitigate the current effects we are experiencing. The Climate Action Plan is countywide in scope, meaning this plan will encompass both the county as an organization and the entire geography of the county. So with that said, the county cannot plan to do this work alone. We have a partner with cities, the region, private and nonprofit organizations, and individual community members to take sufficient action to meet the goal. This plan will be created through a combination of technical investigations and community engagement that will feed into the overall strategy. We're currently underway in the technical investigation and plan to begin community engagement shortly. It is essential we shape the plan around our community and encourage those who are interested to participate. You can find more information about the project and updates on the website listed on this slide. If you'd like to be more involved throughout the engagement period, we ask you sign up for the mailing list on the website where you'll be notified of upcoming opportunities. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at climate at clackmiss.us. Electric vehicles are just one of the many tools in the climate toolbox. Today's conversation is a great example of a way you can participate in helping the county move towards a more green future. Another tool in the climate toolbox is renewable energy. Clackamas County will also be co-hosting an event with Solar Oregon later this month. Solar Oregon is a nonprofit whose mission is to lead the way in clean energy future while human prosperity is achieved through efficient technology and renewable energy. Join us April 29th from 7 to 8 p.m. to hear more about how solar works, incentives available, and stories from local community members who have successfully installed solar. You can use the link to pre-register for this free event. Thank you, everyone. And back to you, Stephen. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, I'll just say Solar Oregon is a fantastic organization as well. Um, I, I work with many of their board members uh, quite often because electric vehicles and solar go hand in hand really well. Um, all right, so I'm just presenting this slide on behalf of Michelle Kinnaman, um, who works at the Estacada Public Library. Um, this may be a little bit uh, quick to jump into talking about electric vehicle uh, charging infrastructure and where it is um, available in your community, but um, Escada Library actually has two charging stations uh, located there. Um, well, technically, it's one charging station with two different chargers and uh, two Tesla chargers as well. Um, there's also one on City Hall. So if you want to know about uh, the programs that the Escada Public Library is doing, I would encourage you to maybe reach out to Michelle, or Michelle in the attendee chat. And I think I have her email listed, if not, 
please feel free to email me and I can pass it on for, uh, to you. All right, so a little background about Forth and who we are. Um, so Forth uh, looks to promote electric transportation in a lot of different ways. Um, industry development, which is you know pushing original manufacturers to essentially invest more into electric vehicles, um, and also working um, policy advocacy. So also working with uh, local and federal government to um, bolster uh, rebates, uh, tax credits, things like that, and invest more in the infrastructure. Um, demonstration projects where we try to do things um, that are new. Um, one of an example of that is we have a car share that will be in Hood River um, that is predominantly focused on helping low income um, low income families and, and communities um, access uh, transportation, and we are giving them the opportunity to access electric transportation um, at a really low cost. So that's that's really exciting. And then consumer engagement, which is through different things like this, you know, webinars, um, or that program I mentioned earlier, uh, where we brought where we bring out electric vehicles and let people test drive them. All right. So we're going to start off by taking a quick poll. Um, it's really helpful for us to kind of get an idea of who we're talking to, and you know what level uh, people are at with their you know electric vehicle knowledge and um, where they're at in their journey and um, yeah, so we're going to get that started in just a moment. Wow. All right. So more than half of you have driven or been a passenger in electric vehicle. That's fantastic. Great. I think we have one more poll question before we move on. Wow. All right. So awesome results from that as well. Um, great to hear that we have uh, two EV drivers here with us. And for the rest of you, that's fantastic. I'm glad, to, I'm glad that you are a part of this webinar. All right. Okay. So first off, I'm going to start with kind of defining what uh, is an electric vehicle, what is a hybrid vehicle, and what is a plug-in hybrid vehicle. Um, so first off, we'll start with... Um, just your regular hybrid vehicle. So this can be anything from just you know the Prius that you think about, um, or like a Toyota Camry that says hybrid on it. Um, all sorts of vehicles come with some type of hybrid form. Uh, now what this really means is that there is a battery inside that vehicle. Um, typically that vehicle is charged from either regenerative braking, or that battery is charged from regenerative braking, or excess power created by your internal combustion engine's alternator. Um, so these vehicles still require you to pump gas. A plug-in hybrid has that um, electric vehicle or electric battery in it as well, um, and it has a gas tank in it. So you have the ability to charge that battery directly. Typically, it's a much larger battery than a traditional hybrid. Um, so you can plug in or you can pump gas. The benefits of having a plug-in hybrid are if you want to still be able to go on road trips and have the flexibility to just you know fill up your tank and go. Um, but if you predominantly do a lot of, you know, city driving or you do kind of, you know, anything within 30 miles, um, a plug-in hybrid vehicle will typically last um, anywhere from 10 to 30 miles, depending on how many, um, depending on the battery size. So when it comes to a battery electric vehicle or a BEV, um, these vehicles can only plug in. You can't use gas at all. I'm sure some of you have seen those those photos online of, of uh, people bringing like a Tesla or something like that to a gas station. So they cannot use gas. All right. So here's just breaking this down with some photos. Um, here is a regular Prius. It is still pumping gas. Um, and then here is a Mitsubishi um, Outlander plug-in hybrid. Um, so you can see there that it's plugged in. 
Um, this has a 12 kilowatt, kilowatt hour battery. Um, so essentially, you can charge this uh, overnight using a 110 outlet. A 220 outlet would be much faster. Um, but most of the time, for a plug-in hybrid, you don't really need that much power at once. Um, so this vehicle gets around 27 miles of pure electric range. Um, or you could drive, if you're going on a long uh, road trip and you want to use that gas, you can actually turn into this mode where you're using this, this hybrid mode where you're using uh, mostly electric, but then it turns on the motor when you really need to like get up a hill or something like that. Um, so that can be a good option if you want the most flexibility, but still want some of your miles to be on um, electric. So when it comes to pure electric vehicles, um, I guess there's some plug-in hybrid information in here as well. 100% um, electric, completely battery powered. You have to plug them in to recharge. Um, there's a whole bunch of ones listed here, and I'll, I'll go over some more models once we move on. Um, but the, the good thing to, or the important thing to know about uh, plug-in hybrids is that they're not all equal, and they all have different battery sizes they come with. Um, and so not only does that battery size affect how far your electric range will be, but it also might um, dictate how much of a incentive you get. So uh, an example of that is in Oregon, we have an Oregon rebate, the Oregon, Oregon clean vehicle rebate, um, which if your vehicle has, if your plug-in hybrid has a uh, battery size that is under 10 kilowatt hours, um, then you'll only qualify for $1,500 of that rebate instead of a full $2,500. Um, another thing is there is a federal tax credit, which I will mention later on, um, and that's also dictated by battery size. All right, so just talking about the charging basics. Um, so in the industry, we like to just break it down and simplify it to level one charging, level two charging, and level three charging. So this is level one. Um, it's just your standard you know, 110, 120 volt outlet. Um, it seems really slow because they only charge three to five miles per hour. It can be a little faster depending on the car. Um, but it's a pretty great solution for overnight charging um, or plug-in hybrids. The reason I mentioned those two is because with a plug-in hybrid, your battery is already fairly small. And so even if you're only charging five miles per hour, um, if you can only go 25 to 30 miles per hour, that's going to take five to six hours. Um, so it's a great option for that where you don't actually have to install a charger in your house. Now, level two charging, uh, this uses a 220 or 240 volt outlet. It can be just a regular dryer plug. Um, you may need to get some work done if you live in an old house to make sure that your panels are ready for this. Um, but these can, these vary a lot more. So you can charge either 12 to 50 miles an hour. Um, they're... Fantastic for if you have, you know, a long ranged um, electric vehicle that you typically use every day. Um, so the use case that I, I like to use for this is I have a colleague of mine um, that commutes from, I think, Scapoos into um, Portland. And so her round trip, I think, is around, I think it's about 35 miles per day. And then she might add in groceries or picking up her kid from preschool. Um, so maybe, you know. 50 miles per day. And if she were to use a level one charger at home, um, likely she could get that all back. But if she were to really use the car a lot and end up taking 100 miles off the range, um, having a level two charger at home would guarantee that she would be able to get all the way up to that max range by the morning. So <clears throat> these are typically the chargers you'll see um, offered at public charging stations. Um, or you'll see a level three charger, which I am about to get to. This is a level three uh, charger. It's also known as DC fast charging. Um, much, much faster uh, than the uh, other two charging me methods that I mentioned. Um, it really depends on the vehicle size uh, or the um, type of vehicle for how much you're actually, gonna, how fast your vehicle is actually going to charge. Some vehicles can allow a little bit more than others. Um, but what's most important to know is your vehicle is going to charge the fastest between 20 and 80%. Um, I like to kind of think of this as, um, it, it's like a safety measure for your battery to start charging a little quicker once it's mostly full. 
it's very comparable to if you had a pitcher of water over here and a small glass of water or a small empty glass, and you're trying to fill that all the way up to the brim, you'd start to slow down once you got closer to the brim because you don't want to go over and spill. Um, so it's very similar for electric vehicles. Um, another thing that's important to note is that there are three different plug types when it comes to fast charging. There is Tesla, which um, obviously they only work for Teslas. Um, there is a uh, Chatamo, which is the Japanese standard version. Um, this works for Nissans, some Kias, um, I think maybe the Mitsubishi Outlander. Um, but we are seeing less and less of these uh, of Chatamo um, fast chargers being installed. We're seeing a lot more of CCS, which is the American and European standard. Um, in Europe, Tesla actually uses CCS because they, um, they don't allow for proprietary uh, chargers so, or charger plugs. So essentially, you'd, you'd have a CCS uh, fast charging Tesla if you lived in um, the UK or Europe. Um, all right. So again, to public charging real fast. So here are three different platforms that you can use to find public charging stations. And I'll just say these aren't the only three. Uh, more charging station platforms uh, appear all the time. Um, but I do think these are probably the three top ones currently. Um, I really personally like Chargeway. The, the reason I like Chargeway is that you enter the vehicle that you're driving, and it completely eliminates any charger that won't work for your vehicle. And this is this is great because for me I really like this one because it's kind of like finding chargers for for dummies which is perfect for me. Um, my first time driving uh, an electric vehicle on a long road trip, um, I actually pulled off because I saw a plug-in vehicle sign and uh, found out that I couldn't use the fast charger there because I had the Japanese standard because I was driving a, a Nissan Leaf. Um, so. Awesome for that. Uh, there's also a road trip feature on uh, Chargeway that you can use where you, and you can say, hey, I want to go from, let's say, Eugene, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Uh, it will tell you, you know, how long that charge or how long that trip will take with charging included. And then it will also recommend um, some places you can stop and hang out um, while you are uh, charging, which is a really cool feature. Um, plug share is, is like, they tell you everything you need to know and more. They tell you everything you could possibly want to know about the chargers. Um, you can use this either online or on an app on your phone. Um, you can actually go on to PlugShare and see if a charging station is currently being used. Um, you can see what people posted about it. It's kind of like a social media platform as well. Um, so if a charger is you know, running a little slower than usual, um, or if it's been out of order for a couple of weeks, uh, there's probably someone who's already commented on that on PlugShare. Uh, Charge Hub, I actually haven't used it that much, um, but it's really popular with many of my colleagues. Um, it's pretty similar to Chargeway. I think it's just, you know, a little bit more, um, has a little bit more information available and isn't quite as dumbed down, I would say, for the user. All right, so trip planning. This is actually the trip planner from Chargeway that I mentioned. Um, not much else to say about that, actually. Uh, you know, pretty much it, it's quite different uh, planning for a road trip and electric vehicle than an internal combustion engine. Um, most of the time, this is a pretty unrealistic road trip right here, but most of the time I'll sit down ahead of time and figure out, you know, where I plan to stop, where I plan to eat. Um, so you do a lot more prepping before the actual road trip. Um, and it can be really great if you know that there's like a hotel or something that you can go visit and um, charge at, because that can be fantastic if you're feeling a little drained and the car is drained um, for you to both you know, get a good night's sleep and then wake up to a fully charged car. All right, so here's some snapshots. And full disclosure, these are probably slightly out of date. I couldn't find a newer one for Electrify America. Um, so these are just two um, fast charging companies. So th that doesn't mean that these are the only charging stations that you're going to be able to find um, in the US. And both of these overlap. So um, Tesla charging stations are all over the place. 
Um, the idea was that you could basically road trip anywhere in the US. Obviously, there's a couple limitations to that. Um, but these are just the fast charging networks. So you would still likely be able to use um, a level two charger um, if in any of these areas where you don't see a little red dot. Um, for Electrify America, um, same type of thing. Um, these are fast chargers only that are shown on the map. Um, you can see on the um, West Coast, there is a lot more um, kind of by the California area. And then we also have a, many on the highways. So this is just the start of electric vehicle infrastructure. And um, we can expect a lot more of this in the future. All right, so we're going to stop for a quick poll. And I will actually start answering some questions while we do that. Yeah, so uh, William, um, thanks for commenting. I didn't know that the LEAF's basic mapping system, um, actually, I think I did know that it uh, found nearby charging stations. I just hadn't used it that much. Um, but that's, that's great to point out. Um, I know Tesla's do, and the BMW i3 does as well. So I'd assume this is probably pretty standard for most uh, EVs to have some type of um, charging station locator. Um, yep, yeah, yeah. Most of those uh, websites I mentioned are also smartphone apps. Um, so you know, you could check ahead of time if you wanted to really plan out your road trip on the computer. But then I'd also recommend having a mobile app with you because that's really handy. Uh, if you don't have a smartphone, um, then obviously mapping it out using a computer is the way to go. Um, a recording for this presentation will be available in probably about a week, um, you know, at most two weeks. Um, but yeah, there will be a recording available and it will be sent to all of you since you have registered. Um, so don't feel like you need to take notes or um, yeah, if you're missing anything, you can always email me too if you have questions. And thank you all so much for responding to the polls. All right. And last one before we jump into it. We'll, we'll be stopping for one more poll. Um, actually, I think we'll be doing that at the end. So this will be the final one until we get to the end of the presentation. It's great to see that there's uh, this much confidence in the uh, local char charging infrastructure. Um, for those of you who, who are a little uncertain, um, totally understandable. Um, just keep in mind that you know we're kind of the tip of the iceberg here and that the infrastructure is only going to get better. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And moving on. So let's talk about the environmental benefits of electric vehicles. Um, and not just the environmental benefits, actually. There are a lot of benefits for um, you know, your wallet as well, because uh, EVs can be a lot cheaper for cost of ownership. Um, so cleaner air, um, you know, there's essentially there's no emissions that come out of the tailpipe for electric vehicles. Um, and, and that is obviously a huge, huge benefit. And, and so much of our emissions come from transportation. So um, this would be a really big impact um, as far as uh, cleaning up our air. Um, so energy dollars are going to stay local. This is a, a really interesting concept to me because essentially, you know, even if you don't care about any of the environmental benefits, um, if you were to take, you know, gasoline and essentially make it on a, a larger scale generator, um, and then sell the electricity, um, that would still be more efficient for, uh, a more efficient way to use gasoline. Um, but beyond that, you know, our, our local utilities, um, create the energy. So we're no longer bar uh, spending, you know, money on foreign oil or anything like that, um, which is fantastic. So fighting climate change, obviously getting rid of, um, having less CO2 in the air. Um, supporting renewables. So this is interesting. Um, in the future, uh, the battery technology will likely be connected to the grid. Um, that way you can plug your vehicle in at night 
and you know maybe you sign some type of waiver with your local utility company and they can use your battery to store um, excess electric uh, excess electricity generated from renewables such as um, you know wind turbines or solar so really cool idea there um, I imagine it'll likely be used first for um, you know buses or uh, potentially some type of um, larger transit so uh, particularly school buses is something I think about because they have a much much larger battery that could store a lot more energy all right so um, just a, a good way to kind of wrap our heads around how much cleaner electric vehicles are for the grid um, is to compare them directly to gasoline vehicles um, so this is a pretty cool map um, made for, by Union of Concerned Scientists and Essentially, I don't know how well you can all see the numbers here, um, but if you were to drive, uh, let's use California as an example. If you were to drive um, an electric vehicle in California, because the, the grid is so clean there, um, you'd essentially have to drive a gas vehicle that got 102, 122 miles per gallon to be comparable to an EV there. Um, when you get into the Midwest, you can see that maybe, you know, uh, it's a little bit more comparable there as far as environmental benefits, um, but still a 40 mile or a 40 mile per gallon vehicle is a lot better than I think the average um, internal combustion vehicles uh, MPG. So uh, definitely a lot of benefits um, there. And when it comes to maintenance, uh, this is actually really exciting for um, owners of electric vehicles. So. Essentially, um, EV owners on average save, you know, $800 per year on maintenance costs compared to internal combustion engine owners. Um, and this is partially due to not having oil changes, not having, you know, regular maintenance like spark plugs, timing belts, um, or anything like that. So there are so many less parts. I think there's actually 75% less moving parts in an electric vehicle than an internal combustion engine. So just think about it in that way. There's just far less opportunity for something to go wrong. Um, and then another thing to point out is that the regenerative braking, um, which I haven't covered yet, but essentially regenerative braking is it'll take the motor that propels you forward and spin it backward, um, or actually allow it to spin backward to capture that kinetic energy and use that to recharge your vehicle's battery. Um, but while you're doing that, you can actually slow your vehicle down without using your brake pads. And so brake pads on electric vehicles tend to last three times as long. Obviously, it depends on your driving style as well. If you're lurching forward and then slamming on the brakes, then you're going to burn through brake pads fairly quickly. If you haven't driven an electric vehicle, which only a couple of you hadn't, um, or at least many of you had been a passenger in, um, I would recommend it. They are an absolute blast. Um, definitely something I wouldn't have expected. Uh, I got into this industry as an environmentalist and was just shocked by how much fun they are. Um, not only do they have instant torque, you know, no gears to shift through, it's just all go. Um, but the uh, lower, center, lower center, center of gravity due to the battery and its weight really makes it fun to kind of turn like corner turns and it, it can just be awesome. Oh, and they're really quiet. Um, some vehicles actually have a safety feature that if you're going below 25 miles per hour, they'll have like a slight humming noise, just to let pedestrians know that you're coming. Um, but in general, it, it's pretty nice to be driving on the highway or something like that and then just not have the noise from the engine. All right. Um, so this is just showing off how many electric vehicles have been sold in the U.S. This is actually only to 2019, um, and this has continued to go up. Um, I couldn't find a more current one, unfortunately. Um, but so plug-in hybrids are becoming pretty popular. They've kind of been steady, um, but I think BEVs have actually skyrocketed up more so um, than that is showing here. Um, and that's mostly due to, um, you know, companies like uh, Tesla having the Model 3, which is um, still a highly desired car, but at a lower cost. Um, and then also uh, companies like Chevy coming out with just 
a lot more bolts. Um, so production combined with uh, really awareness. I would also like to emphasize that you know it's not just electric vehicles. There's a lot of different options if you're trying to get into um, reducing your emissions or having something electric to drive around. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen those scooters. Um, you know, there's a lot of mixed emotions uh, for how people feel about them, but they are potentially a really great way to get people commuting um, on an electric um, type vehicle that will just be a lot have a lot less emissions than in you know a regular internal combustion engine um, being your daily driver um, electric bikes are really really popular right now and they're getting way better um, and they're a blast i mean there, there's a couple out there um, that you don't even need to pedal uh, it's pretty much cheating <laughs> but that type of technology can be really nice for um, companies that want to be able to have a smaller vehicle that is uh, more emission friendly that they can take around um, city limits, such as this UPS vehicle right here. And then that is a Archimoto, um, that little three wheeled um, electric vehicle there. Those are made in Eugene, Oregon, which is pretty cool. Okay, so financial savings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's some tax credits um, and there's also some uh, rebates in in oregon um there are other rebates in other um, states as well um, but i won't get into those um the federal tax credit tax credit is up to seven thousand five hundred dollars off the purchase or lease of a new ev um that's yeah it, that varies depending on the battery size um so for most uh pure evs you'll get that full 75 um or seven hundred, yeah, seven thousand five hundred dollars off. Um, there is one caveat to that as well, and you can check the uh, vehicle availability here. Um, the vehicles that don't apply are by brand. So, if a specific car manufacturer has sold over two hundred thousand um, electric vehicles, um, then they no longer qualify for this uh, federal tax credit. Um, the only two companies that have done, done that are uh, Tesla and Chevy. Once again, you can check at fueleconomy.gov. Um, so for the Oregon, uh, yeah, the Oregon clean vehicle rebate, there are actually two different rebates that you can qualify for. Uh, one is the standard rebate, which is um, $2,500 off um, the purchase or lease of a new EV. Um, this only works for new electric vehicles, um, and a lot of them you can actually get uh, cash on the hood for. So what that means is if you were to go into a dealership and either, you know, lease a vehicle or buy one, um, they'd be able to take that off the sticker price right then and there. Um, okay. And, uh, then there is the, oh, the standard rebate also for plug-in hybrids, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, will only be $1,500 if it's under a 10 kilowatt hour battery. For the charge ahead rebate, it has to be income qualified. Um, it's They take your statist statistical metropolitan area, um, and as long as you're 120% uh, below the median income there, you will qualify. So I, I pretty much encourage everyone to go ahead and, and you know apply for this anyway, uh, even if they're not certain that they will make it. Um, you can always check um, on the DEQ clean vehicle rebate website. If you qualify, you can just go through and they'll give you a quick questionnaire and then essentially they'll tell you yes or no. Oh, and, and real fast, I, I don't know if I mentioned this correctly, but the uh, uh, charge ahead, um, yeah, the charge ahead rebate actually can be used for new or used vehicles. Um, so once again, has to be, you have to be income qualified, but you can get uh, $2,500 off um, a, um, a used vehicle, which is a really great, great thing. All right. Um, so I'm going to pause real fast to answer some of these questions um, just because I've been seeing them come in. All right. So what time period does the reduced maintenance cost apply? Um, 
if you if you mean like the break in or uh, the uh, you know when they will actually kind of line up the break even point, um, I think that depends on the vehicle and what you're comparing it to. Um, but kind of right off the bat, um, you know, you're not going to have those. Um, you're not going to have regular oil changes um, or things like that. Um, and if you have the vehicle long enough um, compared to an internal combustion engine where, you know, if you have it for, let's say, I think it's every 75,000 um, miles or so, you probably have to get some belts and stuff replaced and maybe do a tune up. Um, so that doesn't really happen with electric vehicles. Um, you know, people are often concerned about, you know, the battery uh, going bad or something like that. Um, but most electric vehicles, if you buy it new, have like an eight, eight year warranty or something that comes with that. Um, so you wouldn't have to pay any of those costs out of your pocket. So I'm, I'm tempted to say it kind of kicks into effect immediately, especially if you can charge at home. Um, charging is, is way cheaper than going to a gas station and uh, the electricity costs are a lot less volatile as well. All right, so batteries, um, how long do they last on average? Um, how much do they cost to replace? What is done with the old ones? Great questions. Um, so really the long answer for how long do batteries last is that we don't really know. Um, electric vehicles at this rate, you know, with this many on the market and this many being driven around, haven't really been, you know, tested on the field to see how long they will actually hold up. Um, that being said, the results are showing to be a lot more positive than anyone ever expected. Um, if you were to take a Nissan Leaf, which is an air-cooled battery system, um, you're probably going to see some degradation to the battery, as meaning, you know, you may not have that full charge or that full range that you start off with, um, but um, most of those are only seeing, you know, 10% degradation after, you know, eight years of use. You will see a couple that, you know, have a lot more degradation done to the battery. And that's because there are certain years, like I think Leafs before 2015 had a different type of uh, battery technology. And some of them ended up being a little bit more finicky. Um, and then also uh, users that fast charge their um, electric vehicles a lot tend to see um, more wear and tear on the battery. That being said, you know, you have that eight year warranty, all, you know, all that stuff is allowed. So you should be able to get replaced if you see too much damage on it. Um, they do cost a good amount to replace. It really depends on how or which vehicle you have and what battery size you have and what, you know, the size of battery you're replacing. Um, yeah, you know, any, it could be anywhere from you know five to ten thousand dollars to get a battery replaced, um, which is a lot. But you're probably not going to deal with that until you've either, you know, maybe ten to twelve years, um, and at that point, you know, you may have switched vehicles to another one, um, and maybe someone else is still using your other vehicle with a you know, a uh, slightly degraded battery, and so, you know, maybe they only need uh, eighty miles of range to get to work and back, so. That's one use case is that the batteries actually don't get taken out and the vehicle keeps using them um, because it just might fit a different person's use case. And then another thing that happens with the old ones is they're often uh, recycled and used for, I've seen them used for a couple of things. I've seen them used for off-grid uh, electric um, storage systems. So, you know, if, let's say you have solar or something, you could potentially have a lot of Nissan Leaf batteries that are um, essentially storing that electricity for another time. Um, I've also seen um, in the UK, there's actually a couple uh, ferries that are fully electric um, and they are made out of Nissan Leaf batteries. They're powered by Nissan Leaf batteries. They're not made by Nissan Leaf batteries. Um, <clears throat> all right. So cold weather does impact uh, battery efficiency. Um, very similar to if you have, you know, a smartphone that has a lithium ion battery and you've been, you know, let's say you're out in the cold and you, you notice that it has decided to shut off temporarily. Um, that being said, if you were to take your hands and kind of put it on your phone, you'd probably be able to turn it on right after that. 
So electric vehicles have the same type of battery, but they're way, way, way more installized. Um, they have way better installation, sorry, insulation. Um, so essentially, um, you don't have as much of a problem with it not turning on. In fact, that rarely ever happens. Um, I don't know if I have heard of that happening, um, but you do see a slight reduction in your range. Um, so I think the most I've ever seen is I was driving a Chevy Bolt um, and it was in the winter and I think they knocked off about 25 to 30 miles um, when it was in freezing weather. Um, so it really varies, um, but typically that's not a huge deal if you have a, uh, an electric vehicle with sufficient range. Ooh. Someone's leaf died in a few hours. Well, that's not great. Um, I actually am curious, uh, William, do you know uh, what year your leaf was? Because that, that might play a factor into it as well. All right, I'm going to move on to talking about the uh, vehicles that are available in Oregon nowadays. All right, so Nissan Leaf uh, tax credit is still fully available for this. Um, you can't really see it, but the uh, base MSRP is about $30,000. Um, and you can also get a Leaf Plus, which has a uh, range of 226 miles, which is fantastic. Um, the normal range that comes with the 2018s and above is about 151. Um, this is a Mitsubishi Outlander. It's a plug-in hybrid. I've mentioned it a couple times. Um, it has a range of about 22 miles on pure electric. Um, that being said, I've actually gotten probably about 30 miles of range on a Mitsubishi Outlander before. Um, the base M MSRP is about 35, 36,000. Um, the tax credit is available, um, but because it's a plug-in hybrid, uh, you probably only get, I think it's about $4,500 worth of a tax credit on this one. Um, but because the battery is over 10 kilowatt hours, you'd still be able to qualify for that full standard rebate in Oregon. So if you're able to qualify for the standard rebate and charge ahead rebate, um, even though it's a plug-in hybrid, you'd still get $5,000 off this vehicle. This is a Chevy Bolt. Um, unfortunately, the federal tax credit is not available for Chevy Bolts, um, but they're so widely available in the market right now that they're actually, their price is a little bit lower. Um, and you can find some pretty good deals on them if you are opportunistic and uh, willing to wait a little bit. So. Uh, the Chevy Bolt's 2020 to 2021 uh, uh, model has a new range of about 260 miles, um, and its base MSRP is 36,000. All right, so Kia Niro, uh, this can actually come in a pure electric or plug-in hybrid form. Um, I really like the way this vehicle looks. You, you cannot tell it's an electric vehicle um, until you get inside of it, and it's just really quiet, cushy, and comfortable. Um, as a range, the pure electric has a range of about 240. Um, I believe the plug-in hybrid has about a 22 mile, uh, electric range. Um, the base MSRP for this is about 38,500. That being said, um, most of the time with the Kia Nero, the, uh, they sell the higher trim levels for pure electrics. So I would expect to see this vehicle sold for about 40 to 42,000. Um, but you can qualify for the full federal tax credit. All right. Oh, and William got back to us. Thank you so much, William. Um, apparently it was a uh, 2013 um, Nissan Leaf. Uh, obviously a great vehicle for, you know, going around town and, and doing whatever you need to do as far as that. Um, it does make sense that the battery may have had more trouble in the cold. Um, in 2013, basically before 2015, um, the batteries were just not as uh, resistant to cold, um, for, particularly for Nissan Leafs, um, because it's a uh, air-cooled system versus if you were to buy an older um, BMW i3 or something like that, um, or maybe Chevy Volt, uh, all of those have liquid-cooled batteries, so they have a slightly different insulation. Um, Tesla Model 3, uh, you've probably seen these around. They became very, very popular in the last couple of years. Um, one of the reasons why is because they actually come with 
or they don't come with, they have an option to add all wheel drive, um, which is really helpful here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, your standard range Model 3 is, you know, just about 263 miles, um, but you can get additional miles added to that and you can get up to 353. Um, that being said, some of the older Model 3s, if you were to buy one used, uh, might have a range of anywhere from 220 to 240 because they sold some uh, models with a slightly um, smaller battery capacity. Either way, either way, you can expect to spend um, probably about 40000 to uh, 47000 if you want to add some of, of those extra features in there as well. Tesla Model Y, this is essentially just the Model 3, but a little beefier. Um, same thing comes with, uh, you can get an all-wheel drive package, um, and um, its range can go up to 326 miles. Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention about the uh, Oregon tax or Oregon um, rebates is only vehicles that have an MSRP of under fifty thousand dollars will qualify. All right, um, Rav4 plug-in hybrid um, Toyota Rav4 Prime, uh, really cool-looking vehicle. I haven't driven it myself. Um, it's a plug-in hybrid with a 18.2 kilowatt hour battery. So it's much larger than most plug-in hybrids that are out there. Um, it has a 42 mile uh, range um, and it's probably going to cost about $40,000 for this vehicle. Um, but the tax credit is available. All right, so here are the, some of the models that are coming out soon. So we'll kind of skip through these because I want to get to some additional time for questions. Um, this is actually already out, the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Uh, pretty cool SUV. I actually saw it at the auto show uh, last year before um, the whole pandemic started. So like I said, it was already starting in China. But um, yeah, it was very, very interesting to be at a big event like that because I can't imagine it now. Um, not yet, at least. So this has a range of 230 to 300 miles. Um, they're a little bit more expensive, about 43 to, you know, $50,000. Uh, um, and pretty much all of the, um, models that are going to be released this year have already been spoken for. Um, so you'd have to sign up for a wait list if you're really hooked on this vehicle. Um, but the federal tax credit does apply. All right. The Volkswagen ID4 Pro. Um, I'm really excited for this one. It's going to be super cool because it's a slightly cheaper, um, you know, electric vehicle that comes with all-wheel drive. I guess it's comparable to the Model 3, but it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, let's see. Tax credit is completely available for all Volkswagen, so you can get an e-Golf as well. Um, that's another Volkswagen vehicle that's out there. The Nissan Aria, uh, this is going to basically be the Leaf, uh, Leaf's um, SUV version. Uh, really cool looking car. Once again, another all-wheel drive option. Uh, the Rivian R1T, it's really exciting to see some trucks come into play. They are pretty expensive right now, um, but that's likely due to the large battery size. Um, so you can get a range of 250 to 400 miles. I put the plus there because we're not actually sure if they're going to release another model that has more range than that. They also have an SUV version. It's going to cost about the same, um, obviously, because they haven't sold very many um, or actually any yet in the US. Uh, the federal tax credit is applicable for these. Lordstown Endurance. I actually saw this. Uh, somewhat recently um there was someone who drove them uh through portland and just kind of invited people to just stand and, and watch it drive by from a distance a uh, very cool looking car um likely this car will be mainly marketed towards fleets um because they, their production is so small so um, but maybe something to look out for in the next couple of years. And, and personally, I think it'd be a fantastic vehicle if you were able to get it on the used market. Tesla Cybertruck, I'm sure people have seen this a lot. Um, we don't actually know if it'll look exactly like this. Um, it, it's just hard to know. Uh, but many of these vehicles have already been pre-ordered. And so there's actually quite a big wait list for this car as well. Volkswagen ID Buzz. 
it basically speaks for itself. Uh, federal tax credit will be available for it. Um, it isn't going to be available till late uh, 2022. Um, so if you're really excited about this one, sorry to get your hopes up, um, but it will be coming out eventually. Um, and uh, it's going to be coming with a package to extend the range. Um, so it could be a really great uh, road trip electric vehicle, which is exciting to see. All right, just going to talk about the used EVs real quick, and then we will get to questions. So most of the cars you're going to see on the used market right now um, for electric vehicles are, you know, probably Nissan Leafs. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned um, 2018 through 19 because there's some really good deals as far as the value there. Um, many of these vehicles come off lease, and then the dealerships don't know really what to do with them. Um, and so some people can get really great, um, awesome deals on them. And I should mention, though, you can get a Nissan Leaf much older than that for a lot cheaper. Um, and they're still a great deal. As long as it fits your use case, uh, many of them will have a you know, range a little bit of you know, under 150. Um, I think I've seen a 2013 Leaf have a 50 mile to 60 mile range before. Um, so on those older models, you can just expect a little less range. Um, Chevy Bolt, as I mentioned before, many of these are coming off lease. Um, same thing applies for Chevy Bolt. Um, I, I like this because it has a lot of range. And when it comes to electric vehicles, uh, range is king, in my opinion. Um, the more range, the better. And let's see. Um, the BMW i3, this is another electric vehicle that is on the market, um, on the used market and can be found um, pretty often um, for great deals. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, okay, perfect. I, I just saw a question come up. And it was like only half of it. So I was trying to figure out um, how I can answer that. Um, the Volkswagen e-Golf is a fantastic uh, vehicle as well that... Um, you can get um, in the used market. So with the BMW i3 and the Volkswagen e-Golf, these are shorter range vehicles, um, but the BMW i3 does come with a range extender, um, which is kind of funny because it's like a lawnmower engine that essentially charges your battery. Um, and the e-Golf uh, has really great regenerative braking. It's a super efficient car, um, but you won't be able to get much over 125 miles per hour, or 125 uh, miles as far as the range goes. All right. Um, just going to briefly go over these. Uh, we're going to start seeing a lot more of these on the uh, used market is Hyundai Ioniq um, and Tesla Model 3s. A lot of them are already on the used market, but their prices are still fairly high. Um, a shout out I'd like to do or like to give to um, Platt Auto, which is a used car dealership that only sells electric vehicles. It's, they're fantastic. Uh, Greg Platt, um, the owner, is a really, really nice guy. Um, and he allows you to uh, take vehicles home if you want. Um, you can even buy the vehicle and then return it within seven days with no questions asked. All right, so let's get to these questions. Um, first off, I, I saw there is a question about the semiconductor sh shortage um, impacting EVs and plug-in hybrids. Yeah, um, this is interesting because it, it seems to be affecting the industry unevenly. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough to really go into this about detail, so I'll, I'll keep it. Um, I'll keep it uh, to myself here, or most of my opinions to myself here. But I think Ford uh, has been struggling quite a bit with getting. Um, enough semiconductors for the F-150 and the uh, Mach-E. So mainly Ford will be affected. Um, I'm hoping the other companies aren't super affected by that either. Um, but we'll see. Uh, they, they, hopefully, there'll be a workaround to that tune for that soon. All right. What is the full lifespan, lifespan expectation for a plug-in? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we... We don't really know uh, is the, the, you know, the short answer. Um, and the long answer, I would say, is that you know, it can be anywhere from 12 to 30 years. Uh, if you're willing to replace the battery, then the car could last for a very, very, very long time. 
Um, if you're not trying, trying to replace the battery, uh, we're, we're assuming that 12 years is probably the, the amount of time you get optimal usage out of those batteries. Um, but that being said, we could be surprised because uh, electric vehicles with you know water-cooled systems uh, haven't actually been on the market that long. Um, but most uh, people that are investing in uh, electric vehicles for fleet purposes expect about uh, expect to get about twelve years out of the vehicle. All right. Thank you again, William, for sharing your experiences with your Nissan Leaf. Um, for all those of you who haven't seen it, uh, William said that his top range for his uh, 2013 Leaf is about 50 miles, um, which is perfect for them because they only use it to really get around town. So that's one of the things that I would encourage most people when they're shopping for an electric vehicle to think of is, you know, not what do you do kind of 1% of your time or 5% of, you know, your use case out of the year. Um, but we're like 90 five percent of your trips looking like is it just three miles to the grocery store and back um are you driving you know road trips all the time um because if you know your average trip is only about um 30 miles a day uh round trip is about three miles a day you may not need a battery or a uh, vehicle with a really really large battery um so you could actually save a lot of money there by getting a, a used model that maybe has a little bit less range Okay, what can you share about rebates for home charging stations? Is it about or is it 750 and are the Oregon rebates just for 2021? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most of the time when it comes to rebates for home chargers, those are operated and, and run by uh, your local utility company. Um, so that entirely depends on what they're willing to offer. Um, PGE for the most part, um, offers, I think, I think it is about $750 for the installation and purchase of the charging equipment. Um, that being said, you may end up spending, depending on your house, you may end up spending, you know, maybe another $400 for an electrician to come out. Um, so you could expect to spend some money there. Um, but as I said, I would always check with uh, your local utility provider. You could even shoot them an email and just say, hey, I'm thinking about getting an electric vehicle. Um, you know, what can you guys offer me as far as a uh, charging station for my home? Great. Um, well, I, uh, I talked through most of the presentation because I, I took questions as I went. Um, so I think we're going to go to one final poll. Um, oh, one more question. Are there still safety issues with batteries in accidents? Um, that, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think yes, in the sense that, you know, if there's a lithium ion battery that catches on fire, uh, it's a lot harder to put out than a normal fire. Um, but on the flip side, that's also true for if a internal combustion engine, um, you know, and, and vehicle with a giant gas station or gas tank were to uh, catch on fire as well. So either way, uh, you know, if the, if the accident is bad enough for the vehicle to um, catch on fire in any scenario, uh, there's going to be some issues. That being said, uh, electric vehicles actually have some of the highest safety rate uh, ratings out of any vehicles ever tested. And the reason for that is that they have uh, a lot of them come with crumple spaces. So with 75% less moving parts, there's a lot more room in the vehicle for you to really add different things. Um, and a crumple space is essentially a place in the front of the car or sides of the car that is intentionally meant to essentially self-destruct and take the impact to protect the battery. So really, I would say mostly no. Um, if you were to get in a bad accident, even, you know, I, I read in the news the other day, a, a guy crashed into a semi truck, um, that was parked and he was going 60 miles per hour. Um, and he only broke his legs, which is terrible. But, um, at the same time, the vehicle didn't catch on fire. Um, 
none of those things happened because everything went the way it was supposed to and everything crumpled. And essentially, if you hit a semi truck going 60 miles per hour, that's just like running straight into a wall. So I was pretty impressed by that. Hmm. You know, I, I actually, I'm sorry, I don't have much insight about how the proposed federal uh, Green um, Act would change the uh, the tax credit. Um, I, it might make it available for Chevy and Tesla for a little while longer, um, but I can't be certain. We'll have to see how all of that shakes out. Okay, well, we are at eight o'clock, so I think we're gonna go ahead and run that final poll. Um, and I'm just gonna say thank you all so much for uh, participating and coming to this webinar um, and letting me talk to you about electric vehicles. Um, I believe behind the uh, polls, you can see um, that there is my uh, contact information. So feel free to follow up with me if you still have questions about electric vehicles um, or if you're just looking for advice about where to find um, more information or, uh, you know, which, which dealerships, uh, I've worked with in the past that I trust. All right. Well, thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening.